Uh, my name's Zach. Uh, I work here in the New York office. I head up our consultancy team. Um, I've worked uh, previously with MWR, and now I've secure for coming up to eight years now, so quite a long time. Um, my background has been primarily in penetration testing, both with applications, mobile, also some um, network penetration testing, and then moving also onto some uh, detection response as well. I actually, uh, when we first uh, set up Countercept, I went out to Singapore to set up our team out there, um, and so I have a little bit of background in that. So I guess you've already <laughs> met me. Uh, uh, so I'm Jacques, Technical Director in South Africa. Um, I guess my background for this panel is, is more on the offensive side. Uh, most of my experience is running red team exercises and those large scale attack simulations, so definitely more on the offensive side. And uh, you've all already met me as well. Uh, I'm Jordan, <laughs> security consultant. Uh, I do both incident response and, uh, and penetration testing work. Uh, so hopefully you're not tired of me talking yet because <laughs> still got this panel coming up. Hello, I'm Harry. I'm another South African today. We have lots of us today. I've been with MWR for 16 years, so pretty much from the start. Another conversation. Uh, <laughs> 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 so I've had very... Um, pretty much many different roles um, over the years. Um, I set up the ZA office and also I've been the MD in Singapore. Um, and quite recently, after the acquisition, I've joined the, when we joined Insecure, I've been very involved in our joint MDR business program. Um, so when we combining the different MDR offerings from Insecure Classic and XNWR into the exciting Insecure uh, concept is coming up. So. I'm on the commercial side. My focus has been quite commercial for the last probably eight years, nine years. So, um, yeah, it's me. All right. So, just to get things going, I'd like to ask how and where does threat hunting fit into the bigger picture? And also, for the sake of the audience and the fact that threat hunting is a bit of a misused term in the industry, um, can somebody also articulate what threat hunting is prior sure. to going into that? I'm, I'm going to pretend like this wasn't rehearsed. Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a great question, though, in terms of what exactly is threat hunting. I think there is a lot of uh, misunderstandings out there. Um, one way of looking at this is to um, actually think on the offensive side of security. So um, if you look at traditional detection, um, previously when you have signature-based detection, maybe IDS, IPS, antivirus, and stuff like this, you're relying mostly on the tool to do the work for you. It's doing the heavy lifting. And on the offensive side, you could almost compare this to vulnerability scanning, right? If you have a Nessus or a Qualys or some kind of vulnerability scanner, that's really finding the vulnerabilities for you and you're just interpreting those results. Now, with threat hunting, you're actually looking at the raw data itself. So you're actually proactively looking through, um, you know, all kinds of different logs, either on the endpoint, maybe you have like an EDR tool that's providing with uh, certain data. Um, and you can kind of compare that with manual penetration testing where you're actually using these kind of more raw, raw tools um, to try and actually find the data itself. So, so typically what, what you're trying to do when you're, you're doing threat hunting is you're starting off with some kind of hypotheses, right? So there might be something that you know is bad or potentially bad. This could be a new, new attack that you might have, I don't know, seen in the news. It might have recently been used. It could be, um, you know, we talk all the time about um, office being abused. Uh, for example, there's one uh, persistent mechanism where you can actually create Outlook rules and use those rules for persistence. So the idea is whenever anyone gets emailed, um, you put something in the subject, you set up an Outlook rule, that Outlook rule will, uh, once it receives that email, it will run an executable, which is the attacker's payload, and then delete the email. So it's a, it's a really quite cool way of getting persistence. Now you might look at that and go, well, hey, this is pretty bad. We want to see how can we detect this. Now, your existing tools, you're sort of assuming that they're not actually doing that already. So this is a, a newer attack. So you then need to look and see, okay, what kind of logs or what kind of information do we need to actually be able to detect that um, attack? So you might go, okay, can we pull something out of the Exchange server? Do we need to grab the Exchange server logs? And so you can start sort of writing a list of these questions you need to be able to answer, or also finding the information and the log sources that you need. And then you test it out. You might actually have someone you know, run that attack on a workstation on someone's um, uh, Outlook account, and then see if you know you have a tool or you you know you write a script or something that can actually pull in those logs and then try and detect that attack. 
And so that's kind of really what the, the crux of, of threat hunting is. Once you're, you're generating this hypothesis and you've created a way of um, detecting it, you want to then operationalize that and try and automate it. So you then, if you have some other tools, you create the script, you kind of put it in a format that can be ingested into another tool, and then you're getting automatic alerting on it, and then you move on to something else. So you're able to kind of continuously do this approach. And what this really requires is a really good, solid understanding of attacks, of what attackers are doing. And this kind of goes back to Jacques' point earlier about the importance of predict and being able to understand the attacker's mindset. Um, I forget what the rest of the question was about threat hunting. <laughs> um, how and where does threat hunting fit into the bigger picture? Um, have I answered that, do you think? Um, I feel like you went into much detail, yes. Much detail. Does anyone okay. else want to go in? I can say a little bit something extra and just say, sure. if your SOC analysts are looking at a screen and waiting for something to turn red before they do anything, you're probably not doing threat hunting. If it's basically driven by a machine or something that's automated, then that's not threat hunting. I don't think threat hunting is the entire picture. You can't do everything manually. That's not the purpose of it. So I think threat hunting is sort of at the, at the leading point of your detection function. Um, once you have these hypotheses and you have found this thing once, you know how to get that data, you're ingesting that, then it becomes automated and then it becomes part of that sort of back end process of the SOC. Um, threat hunting is that kind of leading piece, which is the very human driven piece. Um. I'm just going to keep going with this. Uh, just to clearly articulate how we have developed our, our teams in order to best respond to an incident. So we have our IR team, which works hand in hand with the countercept team, the threat, actual threat hunters. Can you explain how that marriage works and how we leverage both sides? Yeah, uh, yeah so speaking from personal experience, uh, the way that we generally roll out in an incident is uh, you know, the client contacts the IR team, uh, we get a, a good idea of the scope of the incident, and we start deploying Omni agents, which is the countercept agent across the network. Um, and then it's really both the IR team and the threat hunters who are looking at the traffic from those agents, looking at all of the events, all of the uh, potential, you know, points of incursion. Um, and we've got like an in-house analytics engine that sort of tailors that data for us. Um, but it's sort of that marriage of the IR consultants that are managing the bigger picture um, and sort of like conveying the information to the client. Um, and then it's also the threat hunters uh, on the ground level who are, you know, digging into those processes, digging into those events and sort of looking at that, that raw data component um, and trying to solve the problem. Does anyone have any questions on what we have covered thus far? So quick question on um, how threat hunting fits in an organization. Have you guys seen it be part of a SOC, like a peer group of a SOC? How does that interaction usually work or is the most effective? Yeah, I think probably one of the mistakes people make most often is to try and over-specialize or, or over-contain parts of the detection function. So some mistakes we've seen made are like people that build a SOC function, have like a tightly controlled room which has access control with a bunch of big screens on the wall. Um, and everyone's looking at that and going like, which one of the 10 people sitting here are the threat hunters? Um, I think that's probably not the way to do this most efficiently. Where we've seen this work well is when you have threat hunting as a capability, not a, not a human role. So it's a bunch of people working together to actually do threat hunting. It's not just one guy sitting that has the job title of threat hunter. So typically when you have a, a, a team of guys doing research, so there are some people doing reading blogs, reading Twitter, understanding these kinds of things. There's another team that's doing automation that's helping actually pull this data in. There's another team writing the automated alerts once the investigation happens. There's someone who escalates to when you actually get correct hits. So it, it's kind of a team function, I think. Um, whenever you have something like a detection function like this, over-specializing and saying like, this person does only one thing and that person does only the other thing, um, then you start having breakdown. And I'd say even, I'd, I'd extend that even further. Um, probably the teams you've seen that have been best equipped to actually detect real threats um, as in the guys who are detecting really interesting attacks against them who are not getting owned themselves and who are detecting us when we do red team exercises are the guys that have almost no barriers between their own internal red team and blue team guys. Um, so when the guys doing vulnerability scans, doing pen tests, doing attack detection are circulating between each other and don't have really clearly defined roles, um, in my experience, those have been the teams that, that we found to be like most effective and best at this. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think I'll just add to that as well. Like. I've also seen it where people have tried to have a very separate threat hunting um, sort of team compared to the SOC. And I think kind of the drawbacks that Jacques mentioned as well, because 
I think one of the key things you need for threat hunting to be successful is that understanding of attackers and how they operate and what they're doing. And realistically, you want your SOC to understand that as well. If your SOC don't have that ability, then, and then you're trying to build a threat hunting team that's separate, it, it can feel almost like maybe you're saying, well, the SOC isn't able to cope with this, so we're going to build a separate functionality. And I, I don't think that's necessarily the right way to look at it. And also, one of the problems with SOCs in general, you know, from speaking to a lot of analysts, is it can be pretty mundane work sometimes. Like you're just like really focusing on these alerts, and it, it can be really tough. And I think having the threat hunting functionality within the SOC within that team is a good way of mixing that up. It's a, it's allowing them to like actually take some time, do some research, try and do something a little bit more novel than just responding to alerts the whole time. So I think building that functionality into the SOC is a really good way of doing it. Um, They'll keep going unless you stop them. Yeah, I'd like to add something else from um, threat hunting. When we um, talk to people about threat hunting, what often that's very much linked to the EDR toolkits that they then want to go and procure. But if you think about having knowledge of an attack, um, the part of the attack that's really on the endpoint is only part of the kill chain. There's quite a big part of the attack that you know goes between networks and where they jump around. I think visibility of the the network and and flows and everything else around that should be included in that data that you have then analyzed with threat hunting. So the capability around threat hunting is more than just endpoint. Um, but given the large marketing budgets and everything that you know people get peppered with, um, threat hunting quite often gets positioned quite close. It is, of course, the EDR is a very big part of it, but you need more visibility around that as well. Uh, so the capability extends, and it should include what the SOC would look um, at historically, because quite often now, you see, we have a seam and a SOC, but now we need a threat hunting team on top of that, and actually they need to work together quite closely to see that whole attack and to get more, well, collaboration and, and context for that matter. I think I'll just add something on the tooling side, <laughs> where the importance of actually that EDR tool is, it's a huge benefit, but it means almost nothing if the people running it don't know exactly what they're doing with that tooling. So. Um, I've met teams that are, have almost no tech budget, but they're quite skilled guys. And so they will figure out a way to get the data and do something useful with it. I mean, we've seen guys running like scripts that run on SCCM and just random weird things that I didn't think you could do. And they're pulling data in that way and they're actually getting a lot of what they need to do really good work and they're finding interesting stuff. On the other hand, we've seen guys that are basically like, they know how to open JIRA tickets um, and they're running EDR tools and they're actually, you can drive a bus through the SOC and they wouldn't notice. Um, and so I think like it's, it's hard to overestimate like how important that um, that human component in this thing is. So I think we overly uh, overly explained the importance of having the tools, having the skill sets, and also the marriage between all parties. Going back to your question, you know, we, when we respond to an incident, we are we are engaged with their SOC if they have a SOC. We're using either our tool or another tool in order to get that data. Our incident response team is in constant communication with our threat hunters, feeding that information back and forth, and uh, that gives us the full picture to be able to remediate, especially if it's a targeted attack. Um, moving into the next question, unless anyone has one. All right. The biggest challenges clients are facing when battling live attackers. I go first. Um, so I think one of the biggest problems that most organizations are facing, not just in battling live attackers, but generally in security, is the lack of people. Um, the, I, I, I think I come back to this a lot whenever I'm talking with anyone, so um, you might hear me talk about this a lot, but the, the, the shortage of skills in uh, the cybersecurity space is just massive. I mean, it's good news for all of us that are working in it. I don't think we're ever going to struggle finding a job. Um, but the, there's other problems that come, come with that, right? When we are in our jobs, we don't have enough time to do all the things that we need to get done. Uh, we can often be overworked. Um, and th this also leads to other problems. I mean, we need to be building the next generation and constantly training up new people um, to be able to fill some of that gap. And not only that, we need to have the time to be able to develop our own skills because uh, the battlefield's constantly changing. There's new attack techniques coming out all the time. And if, if we're overworked, we don't have the time to research on ourselves, and we certainly don't have the time to train people below us to try and take our space. And this is something that, you know, when, when I have worked with um, SOCs or clients before, it's quite apparent that they just, you know, they don't have the ability to do that. They're drowning in just alerts that they're trying to respond to, 
And because of that, they don't have the time to actually take a step back and try and look at, are we even getting the right alerts? Is our detection even detecting what we needed to detect? Um, you know, I, I think I read an article the other day that said there was 3.5 million um, jobs that need to be filled in cybersecurity, which is, I mean, that's worldwide, but it's still a huge number. Um, and so I think there's a lot more that we need to do in that space to try and get more people into the industry. And the people who are in the industry, try and help them really understand how attackers operate and, and what the attackers are doing. And so this is something that, you know, all of our, um, there's, there's ways that we, we obviously try and do this um, internally. But one thing that I think is really important, whenever we have IR people like Jordan, for example, who is both done penetration testing and do it, doing offensive security, but also is doing the defensive side of things. Um, and kind of going back to your point before, Jacques, I've worked with a SOC. We did a red team against them, and they had an EDR tool or a sort of EDR tool. Um, and we were using PowerShell to move around the network. And on the EDR tool, there was just all of our PowerShell commands, which I look at that, and it's like PowerShell, exec bypass, loads of weird commands. And I go, wow, that's like clearly someone in, is owning your network. And you know, he just didn't understand that PowerShell was used like that. So for him, it's like PowerShell, that's a legitimate Windows binary, and he doesn't think anything's wrong with it. Um, and so I think just that knowledge um, and, the, and the lack of people is probably the biggest challenge that I see. Uh, organizations facing. Uh, and yeah, just to add to Zach's point, um, I actually think you know the biggest challenge that uh, teams face when battling a live attacker uh, isn't when they're battling the attacker. It's in that downtime between attackers. Um, you know, there's not enough time mostly where they're you know taking trainings, learning about uh, the threat landscape and techniques that the attacker might use. There's not enough time where uh, they've got, you know, network diagrams built and things to understand their network. I've seen so many cases where, you know, the malicious actors in the network, uh, they're jumping around on hosts, uh, they'll hit a host um, and we'll ask as part of, you know, the process, what is this host, like what, what runs on it, you know, what services should I expect, what shouldn't I expect, uh, and most of the time uh, the client has no idea. Uh, they don't have the, the network diagrams built or uh, the supporting teams in place to kind of give that, that important context and that information. Um, and I think that, you know, that lack of preparation, that lack of skill set is really what leads to those challenges during a live incident. Um, it's not so much, you know, what the attacker is doing. A lot of times the attacker is just using default uh, Metasploit or Cobalt Strike payloads. I can't tell you how many times I see that. Um, and that still defeats uh, a lot of security teams and technical controls, so. Um, what I've seen, which is a little different angle, well, would be when we responded in one case to a bank that got a hit quite seriously by, we think, North Korea. And the lack of understanding from the client as to what this, how this will play out, what they have to expect. Because the attacker may have been in the network for months, but now they want someone to act immediately. And getting everyone in the room to, to calm down effectively, to say, well, we can't fix this immediately. You can't go and pull the plug and everything. We now need to figure out what's going on. And managing the incident and going through that process. I think if companies can go through more simulations where quite often we do tabletop exercises, but that might be quite at exact level. They don't always link the tabletop exercise at exact level with a real life red team on the ground and see how that communication works between these teams. Quite often they're quite separated. A red team is done by the technical team and the IR exercise is done maybe at exact level, but they don't link the two into one big organization where there's a real world, well, maybe an activist group is attacking you. Are we going to do a news report or not? Are we going to talk to the media? Um, now this is happening, now that's happening. And linking those together internally I've seen that break down quite significantly. And then they bring another third party, because this one may be no, one of the big four, and that one knows an X company that helped them there. Next moment, there's seven companies, and there's no single one leading it. And then that becomes a bit of a, a panic situation. So then someone needs to calm them all down. And that's been the biggest challenge in those cases, to say, well, who's going to take lead on what? And making sure there's clear roles. Um, I would say the second part of that would be, as you say, the um, well, the understanding of the attack so that people, well, effectively, both to the business, what is the risk? Because in one case, they were on a switch and you can't go and unplug the switch because then none of the banking systems can switch transactions. 
So now this is quite a difficult decision because they could also inject other transactions. So what do you do? And having predefined, well, at least people that you know who's going to be able to make those decisions and escalate those to the right levels, because in that case, again, that's not been in their playbook. Um, and that turned out to cause more delays than support. Uh, I've actually been running quite a few of these crisis simulations that Harry's talking about, and that's an extremely interesting exercise to actually witness from the outside, um, because you get to basically play out an entire you know, crisis um, in a span of like three, four hours. Um, and the stuff you've seen happening in that situation where you have the technical team brief the exec team on the crisis that's busy unfolding, um, and we have the guys like break out into separate rooms and like discuss the response. And the kind of stuff that comes out of there is, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing because you'll have like the technical team says, guys, we've just had the domain controller be compromised. And then the CIO and the rest of the exec team have that discussion. And the CIO says, cool, there's no business critical data on the domain controller. I think we're still OK. <laughs> like the lack of, the, like the, the mismatch between how, what the technical team needs to tell the exec team. Um, they tell the exec team, like, we want to apply these patches. Or like, it's all completely in the abstract, instead of telling them what the actual risk is. Um, and without training that and without understanding what the exec team needs to know, the exec team needs to know, here are our options. This is the cost associated. This is the business impact associated. You decide what the risk is. Make the decision for us. Um, rather than what, what tends to happen is that instead the exec team gets involved in the situation, wants to understand the technical side of things, misinterprets that, and then starts driving the investigation rather than making the decisions. Absolutely. And, and like I, I think with this crisis management situation, everyone gets taught in their crisis management training that you have to make, you've got that you know, golden hour, you have to make these decisions immediately. Um, it's been burnt into their brains. And so when something like this happens, the first thing they have to do is take a step back and go like, guys, it's gonna be two days before we get the forensics back. There's gonna be a two day wait for us to like actually image this machine, decide what's been on it, and like just realizing there's gonna be delays. If the guys have been on the network for six months, there's no point like frantically pulling out network cables in a half an hour to try and stop this thing. That's the point where we have to like really take a step back and it makes sense to, to actually prepare those things. Any questions? Why is it important to focus on detection and not just prevention? I feel like we've answered that. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? What are the main features to look for in an EDR tool that would actually be of assistance in an attack? I'd take a little stab at that. <laughs> so uh, there's a story I read a while ago about a South American country. I can't remember exactly which one. Um, and they had a huge drug, drug trafficking problem. And, and one of the things that they decided to do was put in a, a hugely sophisticated uh, uh, aerial surveillance system, so like a very expensive radar system. Um, and once they built the whole system, they had the screen and they said, cool, now we can actually spot the drug runners like flying around the country. And then someone said, okay, now what? Um, and it turns like they can see everyone moving around the country, but they can do nothing about it. And I think the key is kind of like in the EDR there, it's like detection and response. Um, and I see a lot of the tools have got really strong detection capability. Um, but it lacks in the response capability. And if your only response is to kind of kill the, kill the active process, um, you're at a huge disadvantage. Because you're battling an attacker who can do anything. They have tooling that allows them to run arbitrary code. They can upload any module. They can run any OS command. At the flip of a switch, they can do whatever they like. And you're battling this by basically only having a kill switch. And you can kill one process at a time. Um, you get really hamstrung by doing that. Um, and I think having the ability to actually do real response, in-depth response at the same level that the attacker can is, is, is something that I definitely look for. Yeah, just to add to Jock's point, uh, you know, I think a lot of response tooling uh, is just keyed around that sort of, uh, I guess, binary yes or no. Uh, do we kill it or do we not? Do we isolate the host or do we not? Um, having more granular security controls in your EDR, EDR solution is really what makes the difference. Um, you know, the attacker is a person just like you are, uh, and when you're battling against them, if they see, you know, their IP address get blacklisted or the host that they're, you know, pivoting off of get isolated from the network, that's when they're going to start taking those, you know, sort of break glass actions. That's where gonna, when they're going to pull out the fire axe and start, you know, taking down databases. Um, or deploying their ransomware and cleaning up and getting out. 
Um, but having more granular controls in place that don't, they don't uh, stop the attacker in their tracks, but they slow them down to the point where it's you know too annoying, for lack of a better word, for them to proceed. Uh, that's really the key there. Uh, if you can take their, you know, say they're trying to exfiltrate a database worth of data, if you can take that connection and take it from, you know, minutes of exfiltration to days of exfiltration, the malicious actor, you know, they're, they're probably there for money. They want the money they're going to get out of that database. So they'll wait for those days. Uh, and those are critical days where you can use to respond and stop that malicious actor. Uh, you can probably even stop that transfer, uh, you know, once it's towards the end of it. Uh, but having those granular security controls is really the key component there. Uh, it enables you to adapt to that malicious actor, their technology, their tool set, what they're doing, um, and fight against them instead of just having, you know, sort of a, a yes or no button as far as whether uh, you're going to, you know, kill the host or the process or what have you. and pull the pull of plug. I think that goes back to the fact that we have live people who have been uh, watching and responding to incidents. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they're never going to know exactly how that's going to play out, but having multiple people working together, incident response and the threat hunters, to be able to build a story is the best approach that we can really take for that. You'll so never I know guess, for sure. Yeah, I guess the rationale behind pulling the plug is we don't want any further damage being done, right? Because we don't know what they can do, yeah. what they have done, what they intend to do. So I would say the... So I'm, I'm just kind of trying to understand. Okay, um, so the, the rationale of not, for not pulling the plug. Yeah. If you p perform a target attack, you don't start executing your goals um, if you only have one foothold. The first phase of the attack usually is to go and say, right, let's put a number of backdoors in that'll call back. So when we get pulled down, we know that we can get back into the network. So breaching the first perimeter, you don't use your only door. You, you put a number of uh, connect backs. Maybe sometimes, you know, it'll only call back next week or something like that. So if you go and you stop the, the first time when you identify an attack and you go and you respond by breaking that and stopping that in its tracks, you also alert the attacker that now they've been identified. So the key there is to not identify them once you know that you've identified all the C2 channels and everything else on the network, so then when you go and pull them out, that there's not another way to get back in. So if you now can't stop them, but you don't want to execute their goal, that's when you then go and say, well, how do you frustrate them? And that's the point that you made earlier. Well, you can degrade the attack, or you can, you can divert them to something else. So we're working towards a point where we have a res remote response capabilities, where you can divert the attacker. They think they're going to this subnet, but actually you're pointing them to something else. Or Instead of giving them you know, 10 or 100 meg connection, now you degrade that to 10 kilobytes. So they might just think they have a bad connection over satellite, but actually you're degrading the attack. And in this process, you, have, you, you gain more time. Absolutely, if you knew that this is the only one and you want to stop them, that's the best way to do it. So basically, you're anticipating what he might do and then degrade. Um, so you, the, the point of degrading the response, so when you said the EDR, <laughs> usually the R is small. Okay. If you look at some of the response features in EDR tools, you can kill a process or you can isolate a host. But if you're then on the attacker side, you go and you poke around and all of a sudden you can't get to that box anymore. And you do that again and that happens again. You know that you've been detected. So yeah. you have to change your approach. Okay. If you still get a connection back, because sometimes there's a satellite connection to another country or there's something that's not working well, you don't, you're not quite sure. And that's the whole point of degrading the attack. So basically, you monitor his actions and, and uh, you take actions accordingly, or right? You, you constantly monitor the actions, right? Yeah. So you, if you don't show your cards, mm -hmm. the attacker may not know that they've been identified. But to the point, what was the question? I had an answer for that as well. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, excuse me. I, I, I'm, this is not my area of strength. So I, I, I might ask some stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> what are your main features in an EDR tool? Oh, yeah, so um, I want to talk about the response features, and we believe there's going to be quite a change um, going forwards. Historically, if you went, when we responded to an incident, you mentioned imaging of boxes and that, you know, that's quite a lot of people that come from law enforcement and backgrounds in the, you know, for the last 10, 15 years, that's been the go-to way. You go and you image all the machines and then you start identifying how someone, what happened. 
But if you look at the nature of a network attack, it's quite difficult to go and identify. You can't go and image everything. Um, that's too time consuming. Quite often, it's disparate networks across multiple regions. It becomes very difficult to do this with boots on the ground. So the remote incident response features are quite important. And when we say remote, responding remotely, that also means you have capabilities like you can grab artifacts remotely, you can do in-memory analysis, you can pull stuff remotely, and then you can identify if you need to get boots on the ground, where do you need to go? So from a EDR and even MDR perspective going forward, so that's, I would, I would leave quite a, a key part of if you need to go and identify, is this a good solution? What are the capabilities that you offer? So once you detect something, what can you do remotely? Because a lot of the responses we've been provided, providing, I would say in the last year or so, uh, predominantly some of that starts off remotely. But you can't just do it remotely because you need people on the ground to calm them down and to run the incident, basically, because usually that's part of the consultancy side. So it's a, it's a joint effort now. I can maybe say something of just about what this looks like from the other side um, to this point, because, sorry? <laughs> so we've been running sort of a large-scale attack simulation. So these mean like we're running attacks over sort of a two, three-month period. Um, and over that period, you, you go through like a lot of phases as an attacker. Um, and this is where Harry starts talking about like the frustration, uh, because often you land on a box and you start getting patient, because at, at some point you have to sit on a box and you have to actually watch someone um, and, and see what, what, what they're doing, wait for them to log into an application, and you will watch them browse the internet, read emails, do all sorts of other non-work related things for like for shop for clothes, the whole thing for like eight hours until they finally log into the thing they're supposed to be doing for their job. Um, and so you will be patient about this. Sometimes you're on an RDP connection over like a, a one second latency link, uh, and you take, it takes two minutes for the screen to refresh and to watch what's happening. Um, so Definitely, the second that link goes down, everyone retools, we re-gear up, we do a new phishing attack, we go in again, um, and or we're all ready to switch, switch over to plan B. Um, if we realize that, that, th that the thing's happening is automated, in other words, if the thing that's just killed my session is automated and that happens reliably every single time, it's no problem, we have a little group channel um, for, for everyone on the, on the team, and we just put another rule on the channel that says, don't run this command, don't do this thing, this gets us caught, just bypass that, don't do that again next time. The difference between that and running against a real team that's looking at what you're doing, like the, the psychological effect of knowing that this is a machine, I can trigger it as many times as I want, it just kills me and I can try again, um, that's nothing. But knowing that if, I, if, if you step one foot wrong, that you're gonna give your game away, and that the, the other side is gonna know what you're doing, and then to not know what they're gonna do with that information, as in if they're not gonna immediately kill the box, they might be watching me right now, what should I be doing? Should I be more careful? Like the psychological effect on the other side is, is definitely there and, and, and is a strong factor, I think. Yeah, thanks. I finally got the microphone after trying to get it for the last 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> on, on the EDR point, um, I do think that, yes, the, the response is like hugely important and definitely something that's um, often missed out. Um, but I'm actually going to talk about detection as well, seeing as it is EDR. Um, a bit controversial, I think, c compared to the rest of the panel. But um, the, t the detection is obviously really important. And I think on that part, what is really important is not just that you have an EDR tool that you know, detects things for you and like, gives you an alert. Um, going back to the whole um, idea of threat hunting, you want an EDR tool that actually gives you access to that raw data as well, so you can ingest it and start building on top of it as well. So you just you don't want to just rely on the detection that's in the EDR tool itself. And then that was all I was going to say on that. And then I think we should have another question. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have a question around incident response, detection. Don't make me a liar. Nothing. All right. What about hack back? Oh, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> to hack back or to not hack back? <laughs> um, personally, I think it's a terrible idea. Um, that might be quite controversial. But I mean, attribution is so hard for a start. So how do you know who is actually hacking into you? Um, you know, like if, if, I was, if I was a nation state, and this would be fun. If I was a nation state, I'm pretty sure I would try and hack into um, you know, another country's infrastructure, another country's servers. I would try and masquerade as them. We talked about this before, depending on my, um, my goals and objectives. But you know, I could be launching all of my attacks from a hospital in the Netherlands or something like that. I don't know. And then 
you're, you're an organization, you've been compromised, and that's the IP address you see, you can't just go hack back into that hospital because I'm, for a start, I'm sure there's all kinds of legal ramifications that I'm not a lawyer, I don't really know. But it just seems like a terrible idea from that point of view. And also, I mean, who knows what damage you're going to then do to you know, the systems that you're hacking back into. Um, yeah, I, I would say I'm pretty strongly against it. I'm probably against it as well, but on more practical grounds. Yeah. I think <laughs> if you compromise, even if you know exactly who's hacking you and you can own their machine directly back, um, what will you find? Uh, a pen test VM, a Kali box uh, with little or no information on it. It's completely asymmetric. What will you steal from the attacker? If they're holed up somewhere in Russia, mm, there's very little you can do to them through those means. So I, I'm not sure. I think it would be a huge investment in time of effort, and I'm not sure it would pay off again. Well, you might, you might be yeah. yeah, you might have to talk. You might learn more tricks. Yeah. <laughs> Typically, when, 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 when we run attacker <laughs> systems, and I'm assuming like most attackers do this, uh, we're using like standard builds, and we're using clean builds inside VMs. Um, and we're rebuilding those things constantly because um, the way modern attacks run, this is no longer the case where we like build one piece of C2 infrastructure and we just keep using that for months. Um, like the second you use it, it goes into some TI database and it's burnt instantly. Um, so basically we're running a huge amount of automation. So um, if you think about like Puppet, Ansible, Terraform, like all these things are things we're using offensively <coughs> because we have to spin up tons of infrastructure really quickly. So we might be spinning up new servers every other day um, perhaps even more if we feel, if we feel we've, we're, we're getting caught and, and, and they're getting close to us. So if you're in that kind of space, um, what will be found on those boxes? I think it would be a ton of work and I don't think you get much interesting stuff from it. Do you, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think I'll take a, a bit of a different perspective just because I, I agree. I think, you know, direct hack back is, is almost always going to be a poor decision, but, uh, a key element, though, of a incident response, especially when you're uh, fingerprinting an attacker, though, is that that OSINT that you do, um, open source intelligence gathering, uh, back at the attacker. You know, you're taking that IP, you're you're likening it to, you know, maybe it's that hospital in the Netherlands, uh, but it's just as important to, important to take the tactics that they're using, the binaries they're dropping on your systems, um, and doing not not active things like, you know, you can't take that binary and upload it to VirusTotal because the malicious actor has just as much access to VirusTotal as you do. Um, and again, as soon as you tip them off, they're going to change their tactics, break your things, et cetera. But um, if you do it in a, a cleaner way, you know, you do local forensics on it, uh, you take out some IOCs and you match those against what you have online, uh, that can really help you with attribution to the malicious actor uh, and not just you know, knowing who it is, obviously that's a that's a nice cushy feeling, but uh, also knowing who the attacker is, almost always there's published reports on their tactics, what they use, what payloads they dump, what IOCs there are, uh, and you can leverage those in your investigation and that can be a huge speed boost, um, especially if you know like what binaries it is that, that they're using. I, I think Harry's been trying to steal Sorry, no, after, to... after After he said what they said, he Yeah, yeah but he made such a good point. Um, I think I'd like to add to that, maybe hack back in that sense, I fully agree with when, if you think of the initial phases of OSINT, um, we've seen where, you know, if someone launches a number of phishing sites um, and they register them and you go and do queries against the DNS, you quite often, well, we have found in the past that someone will make a mistake and they used, you can see what other domains have registered. Some of them they haven't used yet, so you can immediately can put them on your blacklist before they even use them. So you can kind of stop the attack much earlier, so you, in, in a way predict what they're going to do. Um, as, if they're sloppy, but sometimes they are. And, uh, well, because we've learned the lesson, we've been sloppy, and then basically <laughs> someone caught us as well, yeah. I have to add that. <laughs> All right, how can we realistically assess our own detection and cap capabilities? Oh, Jacques was excited for that. I have a strong opinion on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the only way to assess this thing is not by going through like a checklist of all the different things you've got in place or all the different processes you're running and what paper artifacts exist. Uh, I think the only way to know whether your detection capability functions is to test it in the real world. Um, I've not seen any other approach that gets even close to that. 
Um, I've seen organizations that rate themselves as a nine out of 10 in terms of capability, you know, detection capability um, that have massively reassessed that situation and on the other extreme as well. Um, there are some teams which think they've got like nothing in place and they really don't know what they're doing. They haven't bought the expensive tech yet. And then you do the testing and you realize that they, they're actually able to detect quite a lot of things just because they, they know what's going on in their own network. So um, I think doing something like a purple team and, and actually running through real world examples, real world test cases, um, that's the only way to really know. Yeah, I, I think I'd add to that. I'd, I'd say one of the problems that I think we've faced historically in this space of trying to kind of rate how good a SOC is, for example, is looking at the complete wrong things. We've, we're looking at um, like SLAs being met or like how many alerts people are getting through. Um, you know, more about how efficient is the SOC. But you can be incredibly efficient at doing something that's not very helpful and not very impactful. Um, and so yeah, to, to, to what Jacques said, I think there's two key ways that I would look at this. Um, one way is to take um, like a purple team collaborative approach, and that would be um, the, I would say one of, one of the great resources that's out there online is the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. But this categorizes um, a number of different um, attack techniques um, across the kill chain. And you know, you want to you want to be running through those and making sure can you actually detect all those different um, techniques, tools, um, and procedures the attackers are using. And if you can run through all of that and you say, hey, we can detect all these different things, um, and also making sure that your you know your SOC and and your de defense teams actually understand those different TTPs is massively helpful. Um, and that's a really good way of you know I think of a good first step of, of how you should you know try and. Uh, I know you said not to use a checklist, but almost have a checklist of going through these different things can be really helpful. Um, but then I think the next step is to actually, yes, do it in, in some kind of, um, I don't know, don't want to use the word anger, but um, actually get like a red team and get people to do this um, in a way where the, you know, the, the SOC um, doesn't actually know that it's happening. Um, I've seen a lot of other organizations do this, organizations we work with, but also um, there was a really great talk. Um, I forget the guy's name. He was uh, working at Target, and no surprise, I guess they had a lot of investment in security in the past few years. Um, and they they were running. They had a red team internally, and they were constantly running um, red teams against um, their internal um, their internal estate and actually testing out the blue team constantly. And if you think about it from like um, a blue team's perspective, if you're actually able to use that as a training exercise. It's so much more valuable compared to having, you know, going to, I don't know, a five-day SANS course or something like this and you're learning about detection response. If you have a live incident that has been carried out on your network using the same TTPs that, you know, cyber uh, crime actors are using and nation state actors are using, and you're able to use that to learn, I mean, it's, it's like so much more valuable because you're actually able to use the tools you're using. It's on your infrastructure. It's on your, your estate. Um, and, and I think that's a really great way of, if you get to the point where when those red teams are actually failing and you keep detecting them, then you know you're doing a good job because you're actually able to defend against the threats that you're trying to defend against. I'd like to add something else around um, assessing if it's a good, because what we quite often get involved in uh, proof of values. Um, you know, you roll out the tools and then you get assessed against a number of other vendors, and I often find that, well, in order to say this is a good test, you need to understand who's driving that assessment. Because if you go and assess a, a MDR or EDR toolkit against specific detection capabilities, um, and you, you can always write a test so a particular vendor can win. Um, in, well, in any case, because people have different USBs or strengths and stuff. But ultimately, I believe to go and assess properly if a EDR or MDR will work for you, um, that'll include the, the people and the process side as well. So ensure the assessment of the vendor or the whatever you will look, are looking at includes a wider range other than can this detect this. You know, we often get asked to put an agent on the, on the box and then they fire loads of different uh, binaries at it. And that's, that's good for a subset of the attack, but there's the people and the process side around that as well that you need to, in order to understand if this is going to be adequate or not. And that needs to be assessed as well should you go out and looking at specific um, well, options. Any questions? We have a few more minutes left, so if there's any questions that you'd like to propose to the panel, comments on 
their controversial comments, fight back, or applause. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. Slow, slow clap. <laughs> no questions? Any final thoughts you guys would like to express? Or shall we go to coffee? <laughs> oh, of course, Zach does. I should not have proposed that. No, I mean, <laughs> so I, I think my final thoughts on this would be, I guess, what I've talked about already, and I think what a lot of us have talked about. But I think what we keep saying over and over again is how important it is to understand the attacker's mindset, understand how the attackers operate. I mean, you can approach security in lots of different ways, but let's say you, you want to see if you're secure and you get an ISO 27001 audit. Hey, I could find you an auditor that understands the ISO 27001 framework so much better than I do um, and can reel off all the controls that are in there. But like, what good is that if you don't actually understand what those controls are trying to combat against? So for me, I think understanding um, the cybersecurity, like the actual um, attacker's mindset and how um, attackers operate is so, so important. And I think that's key to everything, prevention, detection, and response. Um, and the other thing I would say is that I think we all need to be uh, doing more to try and get more people into the um, cybersecurity industry and actually helping um, our teams internally um, both learn new skills and con continuously develop and also be able to pass those skills on to other people. And I think another huge part of this is actually, I mean, you go to any cybersecurity conference or any cybersecurity event and you'll notice that um, generally it's uh, very skewed towards one gender. Um, looking around here, it's actually not too bad, um, but still like nowhere near where we need to be. If we need to get more people into the cybersecurity industry, I mean, I think that's, a, that's one place where we can look quite quickly to try and get more people um, to, to actually help us combat the, the threats that are out there. I paid him to say that. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Uh, it's a simple question. Um, what do you guys think about um, from Google to Apple for digital services? Uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts? I'd like to hear them. So, you know, for example, um, internet account, right? Who owns the password? The end user? Customer the or the organization. I'm not talking about the organizational passwords. Mm. You know, who owns it and what can you do? Or what, what should you be allowed to do with the password? No. I'll give you the standard response when I hear passwords, which is multi-factor. Um, yeah, multi-factor authentication is just needs to be part of any password strategy. But as to your original question, I'm not sure how I'd answer that. Slightly different, right? Who owns the password? Well, does the customer own it or does the organization own it? Right? You are using somebody's application, banking application, for example. Does the customer own the password? Well, I suppose. Or does the organization own the password? Possibly it's quite similar if you have a car. You can get a spare key um, if you buy a car. You can probably go to the. To the uh, dealer and get a spare key for your car if you've lost your key. And that's based on a standard that they've got. So when they give you your car and your key, is it your key? Probably it is your key, but they, have, they, they know what it is because it's been assigned to you. And I think the benefit in allowing the company, if you provide me with a password, the benefit of allowing me to do stuff with that is, if, even if I know it's possibly hashed or something like that, um, well, assaulted hash, you're not going to do something with it. So, it's, you're not supposed to know what's inside. So really, it's not the password. It's a, it should be a salted hashed version of it, so you don't really have the password, technically. It's, you can't re get it back to you. So you, the only person that owns the password should be the user. Maybe that's a long-winded, weird answer, but <laughs> thinking about it out loud, actually, well, I, I don't have your password. I've got a salted I, hash. <laughs> I, I have that same point of view as well. You know? So now the question is, what can the organization, what can the dealer do with the key? Can the dealer give the key to somebody else? Actually, that is probably a bad example because yeah. um, uh, salted ash, yeah, I, I don't it's have it's the password. Anyway, back, I, would, I was thinking from a, um, perhaps just going to final thoughts. Um, uh, I think a key area that needs to be addressed, uh, well, people often do that, but uh, if you ask someone where does cybersecurity risk sit on the risk register, is it on the board, you know, or how do they quantify it? Quite often they apply classic risk assessment methodologies. Um, you are quite often seen a likelihood versus impact table somewhere. 
And the likelihood table is then based on historic events or on reports like Verizon or something like that. And really, it's not a natural disaster. You can, you can pre predict the 100-year flood line and if a tornado will hit or a hurricane will hit based on the last 100 years, but you can't predict the likelihood of an attack based on history. You need to go and look at the likelihood of attack based on who's, who wants to attack and why. And back to Anthony's earlier discussions around that, you know, getting threat intelligence and making the, getting a threat-centric approach to risk assessment, because that'll really drive how you set budgets for MDR, EDR, anything like that, if you would need to go and hire a team to do threat hunting. And especially in this region, it's quite expensive to get that team with that skill set. And you need to buy the tools, and you need to get the process, and you need to get the consultancy around it. And ultimately, there's going to be quite a, uh, you know, a budget required for that. And then that'll be matched against the quantified risk. So how important is this? Do we want to defend against a nation state? Do you want to defend against this criminal? Who do you want to defend against? Because when we've seen 27,001 audits and all these other audits, quite often, you know, you get other, yes, we are vulnerable or not, but the likelihood is low. So we've mitigated the risk with this control. Now the residual risk is actually a qualified medium or, or, or low, and then what does that mean? So I think ensuring that the risk assessments are done from a threat centric approach can really benefit everyone to get to the real question, you know, how much do we need to budget or spend on addressing the threat? Because it's more expensive to defend against a very advanced threat act, of course, than somewhere in the middle. <laughs>